So, uh, last week we started this new sermon series that I, I think is going to be very helpful for, for many of us, myself included. I kind of told on myself last week and told you that uh, I really need to talk about these things. I think a lot of us do. We need to uh, discuss these things in a, in a biblical way. Um, as I mentioned last week, silent killers, uh, the, the reason I'm calling it that is because there are these things that are just as dangerous as maybe other more uh, conspicuous threats. Or, or they're, they're not as noticeable. They're just as dangerous, but they're not as noticeable as what we see as more conspicuous threats. Things that, you know, we see danger. Most of us are wired to see real danger. I say most of us because uh, some of you, I don't know if you know the meaning of the word danger, but there are some things that we can see that's bad for us in our life. But there are some of these things that we have a tendency to just kind of try to work around, try to get over, and we look at them like, you know, I'm tough enough to just overcome this, or just ignore it, or just deal with it, and they're silently killing us. There's actually a number of things that are silently, spiritually, and even physically, they have effects on us, spiritually and physically killing us. So I'm calling them silent killers, because that's what they are, and it's affecting the church. Okay, it affects everybody, but we, the church, we've got to be able to, to function. We can't be paralyzed by these things. We've got to be able to, to move beyond them. We've got to be able to continue to serve Christ and not let these things hold us back. Uh, and, but there are these things that we don't like to talk about. Uh, we have trouble dealing with. We're, we're a little uncomfortable bringing them up. And the reason that they're affecting the church, like I said last week, uh, and have become these silent killers is because... We don't like to talk about them if we're dealing with it. And then as the church, we're kind of uncomfortable talking about it because we're like, I don't know if I am really a Dr. Phil or not. We don't need that. We need the Bible. We need to talk about these things from the Bible. That's the help that we need to find. And so that's what we really want to talk. That's the way we want to talk about these things. We want to approach these things in a biblical way and not let them continue to be silent killers. Not, not let them continue to be either silent or a killer. Get them out of our lives. Get, get rid of them uh, as best as we can. Uh, they're going to creep up from time to time. But if we know how to deal with them biblically, that's going to make a humongous difference. Humongous. I don't know where that came from. I used to say that when I was a kid. Is that even a word? Yes. I haven't said that for a long Humongous. Okay. Am I even saying it right? Okay. <laughs> anyway, so there's these, these four things that we're going to be talking about. Um, and, but today is uh, loneliness. Last week we took a good hard look at um, worry. And this week we're going to look at loneliness. Lord willing, we'll also look at uh, guilt and insecurity over the next couple of weeks. Um, but uh, anyway, we want to dig in. We want to try our hardest, again, like I said, to find biblical help. Um, I'll just say it one more time because last week I, I made sure to make sure we're all on the same page here. That these are hopefully not going to be dealing with these topics in a way that you've heard before. Um, I don't think that I'm that capable of writing unique sermons. I just mean I'm not going to do the harsh accusations or the, you know, we all just need to get over it kind of discussions. I don't think that helps anybody with guilt and insecurity and worry and loneliness. I don't think that gets anywhere. And so, again, we want, we want clarity and we want understanding uh, biblical uh, discussions here. Uh, we don't want to beat around the bush. We're going to be direct. This isn't just going to be all, you know, motivational speaking kind of stuff. That's not what I'm uh, intending to do either. We're, we're going to be direct. But we're also going to be loving and, and patient um, and sensitive with these issues, okay? So that we'll all end up, hopefully, safe from these silent killers. So, loneliness. Loneliness is the topic of the day. Um, we've all been lonely. We all know what loneliness is. We all know what it feels like. Uh, we know what loneliness feels like. We've all been there. Um, obviously, feelings of being alone feelings of being disconnected, feelings of being isolated, those feelings are real. Kind of like how we talked about with worry last week, um, there are parts of it that are not real, but the feeling is real. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a silent killer. It wouldn't be something we have to deal with. Oh, I could just tell you, well, that's not even a real thing, so quit worrying about it. No, the, the feeling of loneliness is real. <laughs> and uh, some of you that are dealing with loneliness, you're like, yeah, it is, amen. Exactly. So it's real. Now, sometimes, like I said, we create part of it. We create some of the loneliness. We kind of, uh, you know, maybe exaggerate things a little bit. We kind of isolate ourselves. Um, other times, yeah, maybe we kind of got um, 
left out in the cold. Somebody deserted us. Someone turned their back on us. And that's why we're feeling lonely. The good news is that either way, regardless of why we're feeling lonely or how we're feeling lonely, the Bible has something to say about uh, how to overcome loneliness. So whatever has brought loneliness into your life, there are things in the Bible that can uh, take it away or lessen it or begin the process of kind of healing away that loneliness. All right. So that's the good news. Um, Psalm 68 verse 6 is kind of a, you know, sometimes you've got, uh, sometimes I've got a verse or a passage, of course, that I get up here and we're going to break down that, that passage. Uh, this is one of those that's more like a kind of a, a, a springboard, whatever that is. Let's call it a diving board. We're going to, we're going to use this verse. We're going to bounce a couple times. We're going to jump off of it into the water, into the deep end. And we'll talk about loneliness that way. But this is that verse that we're going to, we're going to start with. We're going to jump off of this verse, Psalm 68, verse six, the, 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 uh, First part there says, God makes a home for the lonely. God makes a home for the lonely. Now, some of you are like, well, I want a home here on earth. I want a physical home, uh, you know, filled with people. Or I want an organization that I'm part of that's full of people and friends and things like that. But can I please encourage you to understand, and I know you know this, but can I encourage you to wrap your head around and really grasp the fact that there's no better home than the one that God can create for you. There's no better family than the one that God can create for, for you. So I want you to have those things on earth too. I mean, I want you to have friendships and things like that, absolutely. God's family, God's home is what you desperately need, what we all need. The whole world needs it. Now, they're not all going to take God up on his offer, but, but God will do this. God will make a home. God makes a home for the lonely. When you turn your life over to him, when you're following him, serving him, loving him, dedicated, devoted, committed to him, he makes a home for you. It, it, it just happens that way. Now, much like many of the promises that God makes, uh, they're based on our faithfulness. They're based on our obedience. They aren't based on us being perfect, don't get me wrong, but they also aren't just based on us, you know, just sitting around and, and doing nothing. Sitting around and kind of uh, moping or living selfishly, things like that. God's promises are guaranteed, though, when we're living faithfully and obediently, actively, okay, not passively, actively pursuing a, a stronger, more connected relationship with Him, okay? If we're serious about overcoming loneliness, if we're willing to resist the, the moping and the, the pity party planning, if we're serious about taking an active role and becoming more spiritually mature in Christ, then we can easily start to see how it is that God makes a home for the lonely. And I think we'll see that as we go along here today. So this morning I want to show you uh, four ways, four things that every single one of us, even if you're sitting there thinking, oh, I don't really feel that lonely that often. I don't really feel lonely right now. These are things that every single one of us need to be doing. And every single one of us can be doing. Every single one of us should start doing this if we're not doing these things at all. And every single one of us should grow in these areas if we're already doing it. So don't, don't shut off and say, loneliness is not a topic for me. These are all things that we should be doing and they will help us with loneliness. These are ways uh, that we can all uh, start to put loneliness out in the cold, shut that door, lock it, and uh, start to feel more connected to that, uh, that, that home or that family that, that God gives to the lonely, all right? So these are going to be very practical things. First things first, focus on heavenly things, all right? Focus on heavenly things. Now, I know this is probably the most predictable one that I'll give you, so don't worry. Uh, this is probably one that you could have expected to hear, that we need to focus on heavenly things. But just because it's predictable does not mean that it's any less important, right? I mean, there are things that, um, I mean, you all know what you've got going on in your life when you go to the doctor that you're like, I know what he's going to say, but don't you need to do it, right? You know there's an area on your life in your life that he said to work on before you come back, and then that appointment comes and you're like, I know what he's going to say. It's predictable, but it's still true. <laughs> you still need to, to do those things. So just because this is predictable sounding, don't let, it, don't let it turn you off or to think, you know, like, yeah, 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 get to the next part. 
No, these are important things. Um, the fact of the matter is, lonely or not, we as members of the body of Christ, as members of the church, those who have been buried and raised up with Him, we are called to focus on heavenly things. Every single one of us are commanded to do this. This is not a, a, a thing that you can kind of brush off or say, well, that pretty much happens automatically. You know, I don't have to give any thought to that. Man, you need to think about this. You need to be intentional about this. You can't just say like, no, 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 if I read my Bible and, you know, I try not to, you know, do all these big hairy sins that, you know, everybody thinks is, is terrible, then, then I'll be focusing on the heavenly things by default. Mm -mm. You need to focus on focusing on the heavenly things. You got to actually think about this. You need to be intentional about this and not, okay, here's the other side of it. You need to make sure that you're not filling your life with the temporal the earthly things, letting drama jump into your life that is, that is not beneficial from an eternal perspective. You need to not let uh, the, the gossip and the, the Fox News and all these things get into your life and just take over. Don't let those things fill your life. Those are temporary things. Those things are passing. Uh, probably some of us have noticed quicker than they used to. Going away. All the old days, all the way things used to be, it's going away. So we're kind of getting a wake-up call, kind of getting a reminder, this stuff is not going to stick around forever. So focus on the eternal, focus on the heavenly things. Wherever we find ourselves in this, this vapor that we call life, um, old or rich, young or poor, uh, with or without, we've always got a reward that's beyond all comparison to look forward to. And that's what we need to be focused on at all times. Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verses 17 and 18. He said, For momentary, light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Now, <laughs> real quick, those of you that know anything about Paul, did Paul ever go through anything that you would call momentary light affliction? <laughs> but that's what he can call it, right? Because he's focused on the heavenly things. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Verse 18 says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. See, first of all, whatever we go through on this earth, when we go through it with and for the Lord, it's producing something. It's producing something. We can bank on that. We can know that if we go with it, we go through it with and for the Lord. Go through it with Him. Make sure He's right there with you, that you're partnering with Him through it, and that you do it for Him. You're glorifying Him, trying to bring honor and glory to His name through the way that you handle yourself in whatever you're going through. Man, it's producing something. It's producing something, and you can know that. That's a guarantee, all right? It's worth it is what I'm trying to say. What we go through in this life, even when we're uh, afflicted, as Paul says here, when we are persecuted, when we're hurt, when we're lonely, whatever we're going through, when we stick with the Lord, uh, when we grow closer to Him, when we glorify Him through the way that we handle our affliction, it's producing an eternal reward. And that reward is so great that it makes the affliction that we face in this life seem light and momentary in comparison. It just does. But if you're having trouble thinking that that's true, if you're having trouble thinking, I don't feel like it works like that, Jake. Like, it feels pretty big when it lands in my lap. Maybe you need to work on focusing on the heavenly things a little better. Maybe that's the step that you need to start taking. Maybe it does sound predictable for, for me to tell you to focus on the heavenly things, for the Bible to tell you to focus on the heavenly things. But maybe you do need to work on focusing on the heavenly things and getting some of that junk out of your life because as soon as it comes into your life and your little spiritual bubble is burst, you're immediately, woe is me. I can't handle this. This is difficult. What's wrong? Why can't I handle it? Focus on the heavenly things. We are eternal beings. We are created for eternal life with our creator. And most of us in this room are planning for that, right? So we focus not on the things which are seen, but on the things which are not seen. We don't dwell on the things that are temporal, but on the things that are eternal. Our mind has to live there, you guys. It has to live there. Uh, Paul plainly taught the Christian church in Colossae to set their minds on the eternal as well. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4 says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, 
Keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. Do you hear that? Set your mind. Not, not, not notice, not glance at those things now and again. Not Don't forget, but set your mind there. Verse 3 says, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So Paul starts out there saying, if you have been raised up with Christ. The, the, the meaning of this phrase is clearly uh, Paul saying, if you're a Christian, if you have been immersed into Christ, if you have been buried and raised with Christ. So if you've been raised with Christ, if you're a Christian, keep seeking the things above. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. He's talking about the heavenly things again. He's telling us to focus on those things again. The, the things that are not seen, the things that are unseen, the things that are eternal. Keep seeking those things, he says. You started seeking those things. When you became a Christian, when you were immersed into Christ, you were, you were on board. You were like, I, I'm going after the heavenly here. I believe. I'm ready to go for that. I'm going to go for that. That is my goal in life now. And Paul realizes that. He says, keep seeking the things. Don't do it once or twice. Don't get on a spiritual high and then come down and say, well, it'll all work out in the end or, you know, I hope I get to heaven. Keep seeking the things above. Keep seeking the things where Christ is. That's got to be our goal. We've got to come to an understanding and we've got to come to a comfort level with that idea that we are strangers and aliens, that this world is not our home and we're just a passing through. We've got to see that. That we're supposed to be focused on where Christ is. Because that's where we're trying to literally get to. Now, we can't build a ladder or a tower or anything else. That never turned out well uh, to, to get there. we got to live the life. And that involves focusing on the heavenly things. Don't stop seeking them. Keep going. Don't take your eyes off the prize. Don't get caught up in all the drama on this earth that, oh man, right now it's crazy. We understand this when it comes to... To children, when it comes to younger people, when it comes to teenagers, when it comes to anybody who would classify as youth, we understand this concept of, well, you got to have your mind focused on the right thing, right? Now, how many times, how many programs are built around this idea that if we don't give our kids something productive to do, something productive to use their abilities and their minds and their, their skill sets, if we don't give them something to do that they can focus their energy and efforts on that's productive, They'll find something else and they'll get themselves into trouble, right? I mean, that, we've, we've pretty much diagnosed that that's the problem with, with most of today's youth that you're like, why do they do the things they do? Why do they get into that? Why, do they, why would someone just go start breaking up somebody's property, go messing up? Well, we we've think we've figured it out at least that, well, they don't have something better to do. Why is it that we understand it when it comes to youth? This is a humanity thing. This is not a youth thing. We're all like this. It's just a fact of life. Kids aren't the only ones wired like this. This is how humans work, young and old. You don't have to get caught up in some big, hairy sin for it to draw you into a, a dark place, a dark place of loneliness, and take your focus off of God and heaven with Him. It doesn't have to be some big, hairy, scary sin to get you out of the mindset where you're supposed to be. We need to always be focusing our, our life, our mind, our efforts, our energy, our skills, everything we do, it's got to be focused toward God. And that's why, you know, sometimes, and I'm probably going off a little bit here, but, you know, sometimes people see certain people as like um, the, the term Jesus freak used to go around a lot. Um, now they'll use like a radical, you know, they're, they're a radical Christian or something like that because it seems like my goodness, every area of their life. I mean, the movies they watch, the music they listen to. Man, get alive. Why can't you watch some of these bad movies? Why can't you watch, listen to some of this bad music? You know, the, why are you always thinking about church? Why are you always reading your Bible? It's like all the time. Because that's what you're supposed to do. That's the Christian life. You're supposed to focus on the heavenly things all the time. When you take your mind off of it, you're opening up a gate for sin, for drama, for loneliness, for guilt, old past guilt that should have been put behind you, insecurity. All these things we're going to talk about, you're opening up the gate when you let one area of your life not be for him. When you let a certain area of your life not be focused on the heavenly things. 
We're just like the, the youth. It's the same problem. If we get our mind off of the heavenly things where Christ is, if, we're, if our mind is not set on him at all times, we're gonna, if our mind's going to go wandering off into some back alley and start uh, teaming up with some, some bad kids, I mean bad ideas, uh, that are going to take us off into somewhere where we shouldn't go. And it may not, again, be some big hairy sin, but it may be something that pulls you completely away from where you ought to be. Completely away from the mindset that you need to be in to be able to serve him productively. Listen, if you're struggling with loneliness, don't try to fill that loneliness with things that are empty and meaningless and fruitless. So many people who are feeling lonely, they, they, they dive into a relationship that is not productive. And I'm not just talking about ooh, romantic, you know, that. No, friendships, everything. Like, just think, like, talking to people, you know, like, man, I talk to this person all the time now. I understand, you know, some of you are stuck at work with crazy people, um, you know, and you got to deal with them. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about when you try to fill loneliness, when you try to fix a problem in your life with something that's not spiritual, does not help you grow spiritually, I mean, it doesn't matter how um, not dangerous it looks. If it's not helping you grow spiritually, let that be just kind of something that you sort of pass by and you might chat with them a little bit. Of course, absolutely. I'm not saying ignore people who aren't helping you grow spiritually. But don't go and try to fill the void with that. Don't, don't go and try to make a relationship out of that that's going to make you feel like, now I won't be lonely. D don't do that. So many jump into gossip. They jump into gossip that certainly does not do anything to draw them closer to God, but instead just steals their focus away from Him. They're so focused on the, the gossip. They're so focused on uh, what's going on with this person and that person. And, and what do you think is going on over there? And what do you think it happened to these people? You know, I haven't seen so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so together for a while. I wonder what's happening there. You can think about more productive things right now. Much more productive things right now. So many people who are feeling lonely, they devote as much time as they can to work. They go to work and they take all the overtime. They, they don't leave any for the, 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 fa the struggling family that might really need the overtime. Because they're trying to feel loneliness with their job. When we say it out loud, we can hear how silly it sounds. So many will spend their money on stuff to try to fill the void. Uh, we jokingly call it retail therapy sometimes, but... It's not really something that we ought to joke about. I mean, people who really struggle with going and buying stuff to try to fill loneliness, trying to sp uh, fill a spiritual void with physical stuff, right? Or like so much of America, they, uh, they, they buy stuff that they don't need, money they don't have to try to impress people that they don't really even like, right? I mean, you've heard that before. That's America. That's America. And some of them are doing it because of loneliness or, or other things like this that we've been discussing and are going to discuss. But, but people do this when it comes to loneliness, when they're dealing with loneliness as well. If you try, it, it, it's important, you guys. It's important. It, it matters what you try to fill that loneliness void with. Again, I can't say it enough times. It doesn't have to be something like, you know, oh, well, I'm going to go try drugs. That'll fill. No, no, no. It does not have to be that. It has to be, it, all it has to be is pulling your mind away from Christ. If you're going to invest yourself, invest your time, a lot of it, and resources into something that's not spiritual, that's not focusing on the heavenly things, uh, then it's dangerous. And sadly, if you do that, you'll more than likely go through it all for nothing because you won't end up with that reward. That reward that we talked about earlier that we said is going to get us through all this, that we're going to focus on, we're going to focus on heaven and, and living eternally with God, that reward will not be ours when Christ is revealed from heaven because we spent most of our time, most of our life, we spent focused on things that are not spiritual. So let me say it again. If you have been raised up with Christ, focus on, set your mind on the heavenly things. Our second practical biblical way to overcome loneliness is this. Strengthen your relationship with God. Strengthen your relationship with God. Uh, this is advice that's often given but rarely put into practice. Uh, in earnest, anyway. All right? Now this idea, it is closely connected to our last idea uh, in this way. You cannot, you cannot strengthen your relationship with God while you are spending all your time focused on temporary earthly things. You just can't. It's not possible. So you must live a life focused on heavenly things in order to strengthen your relationship with God. 
Does that make sense? Now, how does strengthening our relationship with God, how does that help with loneliness? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> See, God is, is faithful. I'll say it again. God is faithful, and that's it, all the time. There's no, God is faithful when you're going through this. Yeah, but it's kind of silly to say it that way because God is just, he's just faithful all the time. He is always faithful. And regardless of how you feel, regardless of what you're going through, regardless of whether you feel like you've been deserted uh, and you're feeling lonely, or if you're starting a new chapter in life maybe, and that's got you feeling lonely, uh, I say this with love and encouragement and with a desire to give you some peace. He is there. He's faithful. He said he'll be with you, and he is. He is there. And listen, it's not enough to just know that fact. It's not enough to just know that. Because to a certain degree, I know what the lonely person is thinking right now. <laughs> I know what the lonely person will say. Yeah, he's there. I need to strengthen my relationship. Yeah, he's there. He's with me all the time. He's faithful. But... <laughs> Did you say but in your head when I was saying some of these things? As I was going through this? I know he's faithful. I know he's there. But. No, stop. You want to go on with but. My loneliness is real. I'm, I've never been able to overcome it yet. I'm really struggling with it. Don't say but. Stop right there. I don't think you're fully understanding this if you can say, yeah, I know, but. You may understand to some degree, but I don't think you're fully understanding. But here's how it works. You meet a, those of you that have ever met a celebrity or even just your hero in something that maybe no one else knows their name, no one else knows who they are, but they're a big deal to you. Six and a half seconds with them is a big deal, right? If you get six and a half seconds and you get to touch their hand, shake their hand, and have them sign an autograph, we go crazy. We lose our mind, and we go tell people. We, we took a picture, of course. Someone took a picture because you can't do anything worthwhile without taking a picture of it, right? Am I right? You can't raise a kid without taking pictures, right? Right? I mean, it's impossible. I mean, I think they'll die or something. I mean, you can't do it. you got to take pictures of them, right? But celebrity moments, things like this, people on earth, this is all they are. But we go absolutely crazy if we get these things. But God, the eternal, divine designer and creator of you and me and the whole universe, perfect and holy and just and righteous and loving and powerful, doesn't just shake our hand and give us a, a, an autograph and uh, be willing to take a picture with us and spend six and a half seconds with us. He's with us always. And he's not some earthly being. He's not some celebrity that maybe no one else has heard of because they're not really into that scene. He's over all the scenes. He's involved in it all. His, his fingerprint is on all of it. He's been there, done that, uh, been involved, is involved, is working it all out as we speak. He's divine. He's the designer, creator. He's all this, and he's with us all the time. Yeah, I know, but. Kind of hard to say it now, isn't it? It's, it's crazy. You see, I wasn't making fun of you. <clears throat> I wasn't giving you a hard time. I, I, I was putting it into perspective for you. Don't say, yeah, I know, but. This is a big deal that God is with us. So we need to strengthen this relationship with him. Listen, when we're praying, we need to pray with the, the words of David. That he, he said here in Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10, and we need to know this. Well, he said, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. When we are experiencing loneliness, we need to remember these truths that are found in these verses. God is there. He's everywhere, always in life, and even in death, he's there. And so it will go a long, long, long way in helping us to overcome our loneliness if we would very intentionally, very intentionally go about the business of strengthening our relationship with God. The first part of James chapter 4, verse 8, it encourages us it encourages us to draw near to God because he'll draw near to you, right? Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's what the Bible says. The, the more we intentionally seek to strengthen our relationship with him, the more our relationship is guaranteed to become strengthened. Draw near and the word of God says that God will draw near to you. Draw near to him and his word that he inspired 
promises that he will draw near to you. In other words, your relationship will be strengthened with him. Now, maybe you're asking, you know, Jake, how can you be so sure that strengthening my relationship with him is going to help me overcome my loneliness? Well, look at what Paul taught the Church of Christ at Philippi. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, he, he wrote this. Paul said, and my God will supply most of your needs. Wait a second, that's a typo. I'm kidding. He says he'll supply all your needs, right? And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Uh, that makes me pretty confident. <laughs> That makes me pretty confident that he is more than capable of supplying us with what it is we need to overcome something like loneliness. Listen, throughout his word, God has invited us to do this, to, to lean on him as a way of, of getting through this world, of surviving this world, of dealing with whatever kind of affliction we're facing. But loneliness certainly comes to mind. Throughout his word, God has invited us to, to come to him, to work with him, to partner with him, to, to not do anything alone, is, isolated away from him, trying to isolate ourselves or, or feeling like we're isolated from him. No, no, no. He's like, come to me. Work with me. Let me be there to, to bear the burden with you. We have that, uh, that refreshing and beautiful invitation in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, where Jesus said that, where he said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We talk about that, uh, gosh, it feels like last year, but it may have been two years ago now at this point, uh, when we went through our series of In the Yoke with Jesus, right? And, and we, we talked about what that means. I mean, that he doesn't just mean, come over here, I fluffed a nice pillow and lay your head down. No, he's like, listen, I know you got work to do. I know there's things going on. I'll get in that yoke and work with you. Let's plow the field together. The God of the universe is like right here with you in that apparatus, in that yoke, being like, all right, let's go. Come with me. Here, here, here we go. I'm going to make it easier for you. I'm going to make it easier for you to deal with this. I'm going to make it easier for you to deal with loneliness. That's what he's inviting us to do. Even when you're feeling lonely, listen, you're very much not alone. Remain partnered with God. Find rest in Him. Lean on Him. Confide in Him. Ask of Him. Strengthen that relationship with Him. Don't, listen, do not embrace loneliness. Don't get comfortable with loneliness. Don't be okay with loneliness. Don't just accept loneliness. Remember, the Almighty God of the universe says that He's with you always. And that He's never going to forget you. He's never going to forget you. The third thing that I want to humbly encourage you uh, to do is this. Don't wait. Go get them. Don't wait. Go get them. Uh, so what I'm saying here is, is take an active role in overcoming your loneliness. Seek out meaningful relationships with people instead of waiting for them to come to you. Sadly, I've seen too many people who are uh, lonely just choose to, to wallow in it, to just get real comfortable with it. You know, they're just, they're just fine with it. I've seen them do unproductive things that, that only serve to turn their loneliness into bitterness. And I'm sure you guys have seen that as well. Uh, some of you may have even done that and hopefully now have already learned that, that didn't work. It's not a good idea. I've seen lonely people set their mind on, on not reaching out to people and say, I'm not going to reach out. I'm just going to wait for them to reach out to me. And if they don't reach out to me, oh look, I'm bitter. That's not, that's not okay. That, that's not okay uh, for people, other people. That's not okay for you. You're never going to get over loneliness if you do that. Don't wait. Go get them. That's what I'm talking about. You, you need to understand, if you've ever tried those tactics to get over loneliness, if you've ever thought, you know what, I'm just going to turn it uh, the other way around, and I feel lonely, and other people need to, to fix my loneliness for me. I'm sorry, but let me just tell you that people aren't perfect. People aren't perfect. People can't read your mind. People get busy and forgetful. And that does not mean, though, please understand this, that does not mean that they want you to be lonely. That does not mean that they don't like you, that they don't care for you, that they would hate it if they knew that you were feeling lonely. That, that doesn't mean any of those things. It just means that they are perfect, that they get busy and forgetful, they have flaws. They're not God. They're not you. They're not in your mind. 
Okay, that, that's, that's just all it is. It, it, they get busy and they don't think of these things. It's, it doesn't mean that they want you to be lonely. Listen, if you're experiencing loneliness, let me encourage you to start obeying the word of God and go get them. Go and get them. All right, Galatians 6 verse 2 says to bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. So that's what I mean when I say, and I'm going to show you a few examples like this. That's what I mean when I say, why don't you instead go get them? Why don't you instead obey the word of God and go get them? Because whose burdens have you been bearing lately? Whose burdens have you borne lately? Have you fulfilled the law of Christ by doing so recently? This year even? Listen, bearing other people's burdens results in friendships. Strengthened relationships with people. It, it pleases God for sure. It gives you lasting fulfillment, a feeling of satisfaction that oftentimes extinguishes feelings of loneliness. It gets rid of it. The Bible doesn't teach us to, to sit around when we're feeling lonely and, and to wait for someone to make us their project. All right? The, the Bible says go get them. Go serve them. Go and be filled. That Jesus' purpose. All right? If you think, well, I don't want my purpose just to be about other people. I want to be satisfied. Jesus' purpose was to come and serve, to come and lay down his life for people. And, and I got a real good feeling that Jesus fulfilled his purpose. I don't have a feeling. I have assurance of that. I have confidence in that. It's written in the Word of God. Jesus came and did exactly what he was supposed to do, and it was to serve people. And we're supposed to have the mind of Christ. We're supposed to do what Jesus did. As far as we can, we're supposed to do what Jesus did. Now, Jesus did many things that we can't do. But everything he did do, oh, we ought to model ourselves after that. We ought to do that. And he served. The Bible doesn't teach us to sit around. The Bible doesn't teach us to mope and wallow. And I, please understand, again, I hope I made myself clear. I'm saying this with gentleness and love and a desire to help us all. But, but I'm telling you the truth. The Bible does not tell us to sit around. The Bible tells us to, to go and serve. John 15, 13. Uh, this is famous words from Jesus. <clears throat> a greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. Are you lonely? Well, what have you done for your friends lately? What have you done for your friends lately? One way to overcome loneliness is by becoming what Jesus is talking about here in this verse. Make your life about others. Because some of you are like, wait a second. I'm not going to be lonely if I, because I'm going to go lay down my life. You're going to, you're going to tell me to go die for somebody and that's going to make me not lonely. That's not what I'm saying. Now, it would be beautiful if you felt that way about your brothers and sisters in Christ. But here's how I'm connecting this to loneliness. The, the idea here is that it's not about you. It's about them. That that's the mindset when you go and serve. That's one way to overcome loneliness. Make your life about others rather than yourself. And I can't help but think that that would make it pretty hard to be lonely. Because you're not thinking about yourself. You're not having that inner battle with, with uh, why you're not connected to people. You are connected to people. Your life is about other people. You can't be lonely that way. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, give us a little more of the motivation behind things, more of the thought process that we ought to have. Do nothing from selfish or empty deceit, Paul writes. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Goodness gracious, it's almost like there's a theme here. Like throughout the New Testament, it's like there's a theme here. <laughs> last year, in, in what George Fall said would be his last sermon that he would ever preach at Hillsborough Family Camp, he said that he had been asked to explain how it is that he was able to, to overcome everything that he's been through. Some of you know some of the major things, and, and some of you are thinking, yeah, he's dealing with cancer right now. But he's been through a lot more than that. And um, without getting into all of his personal life, and he'd tell you all about it, don't worry. But without getting into all that, just know that, that that's a man who's been through a lot of um, what he would call light and momentary affliction, but what many of us would call, oh, 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 why me? He's been through some tough stuff. And he was asked to speak on how it is that he hasn't gotten down and given up. How is it? And he, he's like, you know, I know George, and George would probably like to have dug into to some deep Old Testament scripture that's misunderstood by most, but this is what he was asked to talk about. He said, if you really want to know, 
If you really want to know how it is that, that I've done it, it's, it's not some big technical thing. It's not some hard to memorize formula or something you have to take to your refrigerator all the time. He said, here's how I do it. I don't attend pity parties. And when he said that, I think everybody was, took them a second, had to go three or four rotations through their brain. I don't attend pity parties. Now, if you want that to sound harsh, it will. But if you're serious about overcoming loneliness, you can understand what that means, I'm sure. He never said, woe is me. He never said, uh, why do I have it so rough? Why am I going through this? He never asked, why me? He didn't participate in other people's pity parties. He didn't uh, plan any of his own. And he didn't throw any of his own. And he didn't invite anybody else into, into those kinds of things. If we're going to overcome loneliness, this is great advice. Don't sit around, wallow in your loneliness. Don't sit around and wait for something good to happen. Go get them. Go serve them. Go, go love them. Go help them. Go bear other people's burdens. Go show them love. Go take an active role in forming meaningful connections with other people. And then the, the fourth and final biblical way that I want to encourage you to overcome loneliness is this. Be devoted to the body of Christ. Be devoted to the body of Christ. Now, the body of Christ, his church, is probably the best medicine for loneliness. We're, we're all so different from one another, yes, but where it matters most, we've been connected by what matters most. We are part of one body, the one body, with one mind, of one spirit, one purpose. And if you will humbly, honestly, sincerely, and faithfully devote yourself to this body, to the body of Christ, God will see to it that you find your place within it. God will see to that. Remember where we started? Psalm 68, our little diving board. <laughs> Psalm 68, verse 6. God makes a home for the lonely. God makes a home for the lonely. Now, I'll tell you, scholars and Bible translators, um, from, from what I've looked at and studied, and, and some of you are sitting there with other translations besides the New American Standard Bible that I'm reading from, and, and you're thinking, that's not what mine says. And so you, you probably realize, uh, and I'll tell you, Scholars, Bible translators, they, they have some disagreement on exactly how this should be stated. Exactly, specifically what this means. But I think, actually I know, at a, at a bare minimum, I think we can at least see one big way that God makes a home for the lonely. How he sets us within a, a family. He provides us with a place at his table. And we've talked about that in a couple of sermon series. Place at the table, place at the table, dot, dot, dot. Again, I'm really creative with my, my titles. Anyway, we know what that means, to, to be given a place at his table, his banquet table, now and forevermore. Already with him in a sense, and then to be with him with our heavenly body uh, in the end when he returns for us. He's given us a place at his table. He has adopted us into his family and it's a big family. Romans chapter 12, verse 5, Paul says, So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, he says, And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Guys, what a beautiful way that our God has crafted for us so that we don't have to be lonely. What, what, a, what a beautiful, deep, well thought out. I, I mean, I get it. Sometimes you're like, the church has burned me. Someone from a church has burned me. Um, I, I haven't experienced what I think I should in the church. I know it's not always perfection. And I know sometimes you want those meaningful, um, I'll say physical relationship, you know what I mean? Someone on earth here that is a, a, a best friend. Or a, a, a significant other, a spouse, or whatever. I know you want those relationships too. But this is, the, this is the deep one. This is the one that matters. This is the one that's eternal, right? In heaven, they're neither given in marriage or not married and all that. You know, in heaven, it's the family, it's the, the body of Christ, it's the church. 
This is the family that you are going to be with forever if you're faithful until death. God gives a home to the lonely. He, in your translation may say something like, he sets the lonely in families, something like that. He does that now. He gives us family, and we're going to be with this family through eternity. There's so much to, to a life in Christ that, that leads us away from loneliness when we're, when we're faithful. We couldn't possibly cover it all this morning. We, we can't get through it all. But when you feel loneliness creeping in on you or, or, or when even if you're deep inside of it right now, do a quick check on these things that we've talked about. You know, ask yourself these questions. We talked about first, where's your focus? All right, you need to focus on the heavenly things, right? Has it been on heavenly things? Or is too much uh, of your time and your, your mind space being spent on earthly temporary things? Secondly, are you working consistently to strengthen your relationship with your God? And remember, draw near to Him, and He will draw near to you. And third, are you sitting around waiting on meaningful connections to just happen? Or are you getting up, getting out, going, and getting involved in, in loving others and serving them and helping them and bearing their burdens and so on? Remember, don't wait. Go get them. And then last, as we just said, be devoted to the body of Christ. Uh, ask yourself, are, are you distant? From the body of Christ? Are you kind of disconnected and isolated uh, from the body of Christ? Do you feel that way? Are you that way? Maybe you don't feel that way, but do others see you that way? There are some people that are like that. They're like, no, I'm good. I'm, I'm good. I, I get about as much of the church as I want. What do other people think, do you think? Ask yourself these things. Are you busy uh, serving within the body? If you're an elbow, or are you bending? If you're a, a hand, are you grasping? Are you, are you doing your part as the body? If you're an eye, are you seeing? If you're a, a, an ear, are you listening? These things are important. Humbly get involved and, and do your part. Now, none of us are going to be able to do these things all so perfectly that we never experience loneliness again in our life. Don't, don't, don't misunderstand that. Don't, don't expect that. Don't expect to never, ever feel lonely again if you just work on these four things. But these four things will keep you out of uh, the, the loneliness gutter most of the time and will help you get out of these things. But don't expect to never feel lonely again because you're not going to perfectly do this. You're not going to have a, a relationship with God that is just perfectly harmonious at all times because you'd be his son or something if you did that. You, you can't do that. So don't expect to never feel lonely again. But as I've said, when you feel it creeping in, take a quick spiritual temperature in these areas and, and address where it needs your attention. You turn graves into gardens.